it's always an interesting expectation that I have every day that I get into my devotionals. Because every day, I look at them as the way that God is going to prepare me for the day. I consider well, as I read them, the words that God has spoken through them in order to inspire me in the direction that He wants me to go. He uses my devotionals to frame the outward edges of my mind so that I would use them kind of like blinders. You know, like a horse used to have these blinders so that it would protect the horse from seeing to the right or to the left. Kind of like they do in New York City when they have horse-drawn carriages. And using those disciplines that a devotional can do, I like to put kind of like blinders to focus me in on like a golfer does, you know, when he gets down on his hands and knees and he cups his eyes, you know, and he's got his hat on and he's kind of doing this kind of thing to see which way the grain goes. That's what I want to know today. Which way is the grain going? How am I able to, you know, manage the circumstances of my life to see which way I should go? Should I, like, maybe putt up the hill and have it roll back down? You know, how should I arrange my day in order to coordinate it in the way that I think that God is directing me so that I would be blessed today? As opposed to kind of like, you know, dealing with the struggles that I go through every day. Huh. I'm thrilled about that. So I look forward to and I grab a hold of my devotionals like, oh, wow, what's going to happen today? And I even tell my wife that. Sometimes I've even told her, I've looked at devotionals and said, uh-oh, and I've looked at tomorrow, you know, for which difference is there from today to tomorrow? Well, I kind of like get a heads up once in a while, so I kind of look at it and I go, uh-oh, tomorrow's going to be a bad day. <laughs> and it's never a bad day, but it's a challenging one. But you see, that's the difference between your personal relationship and your interrelationship with God. Your personal relationship is one of interpersonal communication that you relate to God. Your interrelationship with God is the one that you have that relates in some level of some type of personality quirk that you have that you deal with God in that way. So God will work through the circumstances of your life in order to speak to you in some way if that's the only way that he can speak to you. But he prefers to choose to use his word as well as that direct communication that he can have with you if you would seek him with all of your heart. Now a lot of people tell me, and I've, I've gotten occasionally, I don't claim to get tons of email, but that's because I don't check it. <laughs> oh well, you know, I get a lot of email of all kinds of Christian material, so I don't get direct communication unless somebody contacts me by Facebook. <laughs> Then it's like, oh, okay, you know, and I write back. But more often than not, most people will ask me, well, I sought the Lord, you know, and he didn't, he didn't speak. Then keep looking, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, keep directing your attention of the attitude of your heart towards him, and he will. As a matter of fact, he may shock you because instead of communicating to you, as you're continually seeking him, he may enoch you. You never heard of that? Enoch you? Enoch. Enoch you. He might enoch you right into heaven. I mean, literally, just, you know, I just got tired of listening to this person, so I'm bringing him to heaven. <laughs> oh, well, and I don't mean rapture, I mean just, oh. So, the interesting thing, you know, and that brings me to another point, is like people think, oh, well, you know, I'm looking forward to the rapture, the rapture. Why not just do the Enoch thing? You know, every day wake up and just get taken away. <laughs> no offense, but you could get there sooner than later. And I always said, you know, God can do anything he wants to, you know, no offense. But, you know, you really don't have to play the rapture card, you know, in order to get to heaven. You could go with, you know, like, hey, Enoch walked, you know, and spent time with God. See, God never wanted you to focus in on the idea of escapism or some type of truism meaning that you think you got to do ism, something that's going to make you prepared ism so that you can get to the ism part of taking everyone with you that you think is going to go or not go. God wants you, you, today, now, right here, in this place. He wants you as you are to talk to him where he is so that the two of you can communicate about who you are and who he is and you can make interlocution which means interconnection, which means to have fellowship one with another, which even means to, I can't think of the word, but it's a word that is usually used in a different context that people go, oh no, 
it's sexual, and that's not really what the word meant, but, you know, it means to connect. But the point being is that I look forward to every day connecting with my God. I don't know about your God, but, you know, hey, if your God's my God, then guess what? <laughs> He's always talking. He's written his word in order for us to be instructed in righteousness and coordinate our life accordingly and to be taught doctrine and encouraged and exhorted and trained and, you know, the whole shebang. But, you know, devotionals for me, they give me a snapshot of the day. They give me a shortcut. They give me a way to prepare myself and my heart to receive his word because I still read the word. I still get into the Bible. I still get into the fullness of the richness of the studying of the Word of God and how it applies coordinated in my life as I'm going through maybe a kind of a Moses stage, you know, parting the Red Sea, you know, or I'm going through a David stage, oh my God, what have I done, you know, or I'm going through a Paul stage where it's like, yeah, let's go and conquer, never mind Barnabas, we're going, you know, Timothy, but the point is, I do according to God speaking to me. And I would suspect that you should do according to God speaking to you. Because that's the way that the Spirit of God works in our life. The Spirit of God makes applicable. I love that word, applicable. In other words, the Spirit of God makes personal. The Spirit of God quickeneth. The Spirit of God makes alive. <laughs> The Spirit of God breathes life into the words. In other words, they're just words. Let's be real. They are. They're just words. But add the Holy Spirit. Wow. Guess what happens? They become the word of life. The word of God. The word that God is speaking literally to you. That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And that's how the Holy Spirit does it. He takes a word and makes it proceed from God, which who is he, that's who he is, to you, as the Spirit gives ears to hear what the Spirit of God would say. In the multitude of words there wants not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. My beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Oops! <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> I'm a man of many words. <laughs> so I have to be careful with my words, and I am very structured in the confluence and convergence of the words that I choose to use, even as you heard the way that I stopped and articulated those words while my mind could conceive of that with which I was perceiving the direction that the words would go so that I would be able to know that they were in and of themselves not with sin involved, but rather with the directional pointing towards God, so that I would know that there would not be in that multitude of words, sin. <laughs> but, <laughs> at the same time, I'm just as carnal as anyone else. I could flip out and lose it. <laughs> uh, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that rules his spirit than he that takes a city. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. But thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth, and keep the door of my lips. Jesus suffered for us, leaving us an example, that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weaned and faint in your mind. In their mouth was found no guile, but they are without fault before the throne of God. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> I know I'm smiling because I'm thinking, what do you say to that with a man of words such as I am and the choices that I have to make in order to articulate the oracles of God, so to speak, or the word of God as God gives inspiration? Because when you remain silent, 
you feel as though if you're a man of God, teaching or reaching or sharing or declaring or proclaiming or preaching, as we have discussed that before, that often when it's a one-sided conversation, it is preaching, not teaching. But in the articulation process of choosing your words carefully and knowing that God is using the words themselves, there is that fine line of walking where God would take you to dare to express yourself in a way that people will be ministered to as opposed to the sin that so easily is able to proceed out of your mouth when you have to make those kinds of choices then you kind of recognize that there's a accountability for the responsibility of being someone who's sharing the Word of God and I see a lot of times people don't take that seriously especially on posting or writing or sometimes doing things on social media that they don't realize maybe you shouldn't have done that maybe you don't want to fill the cup of your sinfulness since I have no other cup my insure can but God takes your words and pours them in and pours them back and forth as a distillery The things that are good are profitable and and of good report. Then God uses those things and pours them into another cup, the cup of blessing. But he also pours your sinful words into another cup, the cup of, <laughs> dare I say, the cup of you? <laughs> no, <laughs> just kidding. But the cup of... I want to say devastation. It's funny because it's the only word that's coming to my mouth. I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit to tell me something. I'm like, zoop, blank. But, you know, the cup of blessing is one that God fills for you with those things that you've said and done in His sight. And He pours that blessing out upon you as you live your life. But then also, He chooses to use that cup to make you aware of He would rather be given to giving you that cup of blessing than to give you the cup of languishing, the cup of cursings, the cup of the condemnation, the cup of I, I, the only thing I can think of is sin. It's it's like four cups, you know, it's, it's kind of like Pesach, it's like Passover. You know, there's cups that you eat, you know, a cup of, and we take the, you know, we take our finger and we dip and we throw down, you know, curses, you know, that have come from God that have been judgment. The, literally, what the cup is, a cup of judgment. You know, it's like when God pours out his wrath, he pours it out from a cup. And the cup of judgment is something that comes upon your words and you fill your cup of judgment upon yourself, literally, by your own words and deeds. And when he pours them out, they come out before you in heaven, so to speak, and they condemn you. It's not just something that's written down, but it's something that fills and has life. And the words you speak have life and they are recorded, they are kept in heaven. And so you are accountable for them. And that's not to condemn you, but it's to cause you to realize that there is that which hurts and that which causes pain and suffering. There is that which causes death. There is that which causes murder. And it is in the mouth and the tongue. It is in the words that you say and the things that you speak. As well as the words that you write, which a lot of people forget. And so we ought to be careful of these words that we choose to use so flippantly and so flagrantly abusive of each other but rather we need to curb and curtail our conversation so that we would rightly arrange our lifestyle which is what the King James word conversation meant was lifestyle and countenance and the way that you arranged your face and your clothes and the presented yourself as a man honorable unto God or as a vessel of wrath. See, there are vessels of honor and vessels of wrath, and that's what I was trying to get to was the vessels part rather than the cup. God wants to pour out upon you a vessel of blessing. He wants to make you a vessel of honor. But when you are poured back that with which you have stored up in heaven, will it be more of a vessel of wrath? because of judgment of the words that you've said and the things that you've done? Or will it be a vessel of honor because of all the blessings that you poured out? I would say, use your words carefully because they are stored in heaven for you to one day arise and to be revealed in heaven for what the manner and the, the manifestation of what your words were 
as well as what your deeds were. It doesn't mean to be a hypocrite by choosing to use you know, the mask to hide behind you know, pleasant words that are speaking forth you know, and telling everyone, oh, what a wonderful person you are. Though in some ways that may be a part of ministry, the reality of the factuality of what God wants you to do with His Word is to speak forth the truth, not lies. And so there's always a balancing act when it comes to the Word of God and conversation as far as the words that you're speaking. Be careful. Don't you know? Be one of those people that can f bomb it and b bomb it and d bomb it and whatever bomb it you know with all kind of vomit that can come out of your mouth. Rather, choose to be that type of person that is like a wellspring of living waters. That things that come out of your mouth somehow you can make that little. I do this little symbol thing that the heart you know just goes you know pours out, just pours out to everyone around you, and the heart of it is love because that's what a heart should be full of, love. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when you take that symbol, you know, kind of people do it like this just to hold it as a one heart. I like to do it like this. I like to take my hands and just form the outward manifestations of a heart that we use, you know, in Valentine's and all those other things. But when you do it this way, it's kind of like pouring out upon people and then ending it in prayer. And I like to take it there because that's where our heart should be. It should be in the reality of God, knowing Him and interrelating with Him. So that the things of our words and the things of our thoughts and the things of our mind and the actions that we do would all come from His heart and not mine or yours.